I could encourage everyone to take their seats, we'll, we'll get started. Hello, I'm Robert Greenhill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. With a partnership in the microphone now established, we can start this conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Greenhill, Managing Director of the Forum. And I'm extremely pleased to uh, be part of this conversation over the next hour and a half on an incredibly important but often amorphous uh, topic, that whole question of partnership and innovative partnerships for development. And uh, one can debate a long time what does development mean, but one can also debate for a long time what does partnership mean. And partnership is one of those elements like love or democracy which are critically, incredibly important, often difficult to define and even more difficult to execute and maintain over time. And it's essential to us uh, working together effectively. So I'm delighted to have uh, with us here today an extraordinary mix of people who, through their institutions and their individual work, demonstrate the concept of partnership in action. And so um, I would like to um, encourage you to engage with us in this conversation on how do we take partnership from words to actions to results. And uh, to start, uh, it's my great pleasure to turn the microphone over to President Kikwete, uh, who is a great example of partnership in so many different ways. Sir, the floor is yours. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, we are, we are here to discuss innovative partnership for development, partnerships for development. Let me start off by saying that um, partnerships are both desirable and necessary for development, both at national level, or at national, regional, and, and, and global level. If, if I can take the case of Tanzania, let me take the case of agriculture where we are 80% of the people live in rural areas and they depend on agriculture as the mainstay. But it is, it is a sector that is characterized by very low levels of productivity. As such, the peasants are subsistent. There is food insecurity amongst themselves, but also there is poverty that is widespread among, um, um, among the farmers. So developing our agriculture has been one of our main preoccupations from, from independence with our first president, President Yerele. He undertook a number of initiatives in order to kickstart agriculture. So among the things that we recently decided to do was bring in partnership. Of course, we have the traditional partnership between the government and our development partners. But later, we discovered we, we need to bring in partnership with the private sector. We have, we have, a, we have a, a, in the country what we call the Tanzania National Business Council. It's a forum where the private sector and the government meet regularly. We discuss issues of mutual interest. We discuss challenges. We look forward at a number of visions. And three years ago, in one of the discussions, we, we discussed agriculture. We discovered that there are a number of problems in agriculture. And we need to involve the private sector in order to unlock some of the constraints that are, are facing our agricultural sector. We formed a joint committee to look into the issues and agree what we can do together. 
we came up with a strategy. We gave a famous name to this, or phrase to this strategy in Kiswahili, Kilimo Kwanza, the local language, but in the English translation, we said it, it means agriculture first. So all of us in government and the, and, and the private sector agreed that agriculture should be first. So we brought in partnership of involving the, the private sector now in what we're actually doing, specifically asking them to be part of, the, part of the production, agricultural production, if they want to get involved in, but also to be part of, uh, part of producing for agriculture in terms of providing the basic inputs, fertilizers, seeds, and so on, but also to be part of a process of buying from agriculture, getting involved in the agribusiness in the, in the agricultural value, value chain. Well, after two years at the, at the last World Economic Forum in Dar es Salaam, we had a special session on agriculture. It was one of my wishes to Professor Klaus that the World Economic Forum on Africa, we should give agriculture more attention. We had a sideline meeting, a few like-minded people from governments, international organizations, the international private sector. There again we agreed on a partnership. So we brought that partnership now from the local level to the international level by bringing in international business to be part of us. We formed a joint committee to look at the partnership. And in the discussions we agreed, in terms of rules of engagement, we're going to get involved together, work together. But how do we work together? Let's, let's be focused. And we agreed that we're going to be focused to look at the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor. This is, this is the breadbasket of Tanzania. We get the bulk of our corn or maize from there. A lot of rice comes from there. Uh, potatoes come from there. Beans come from there. So almost when it comes to food, this is the, the place. So we said we bring in the partnership of Tanzania, international local business, international business, development partners, foundations, where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, AGRA as an important part of that. So we, 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 we brought international agencies like the USID. Then jointly we sat down and say, how do we do it? We formed an executive committee with membership from the government, from the Tanzanian business community, from, our, from, the, from the international business, from development partners, from agencies like USAID, NORAD, Now we have developed, we came up with an investment blueprint, which we launched at, 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 at the Davos World Economic Forum meeting. It's a 20-year program. 3.4 billion investments will be made. Annual returns from this going to 1.3 billion. 420,000 people will be employed. 2.3 million people will be lifted out of poverty. There is going to be a lot of food to be produced, far more than what Tanzania needs. This breadbasket of Tanzania now can become the breadbasket of the region. It can also become the breadbasket of other, 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 other countries beyond, beyond our region. So this, this is one example of a partnership, which is, which is an already ongoing.
It's already started. We, 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 we are now at the implementation phase. But another partnership with AGRA. The boss is here. <laughs> Agra again is, a, is another partnership. There is Bill and Melinda Gates in there. Our very illustrious brother is, is chairing that initiative. It's Ford Foundation. Financial institutions are also there. USAID is part of that. Again, it is working with us. What, they have, what have they been doing? Supporting smallholder farmers. Extending, supporting them with the inputs, seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. But the good thing also with this initiative, it's just like the, 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 the other big initiative we are, we are doing for the whole corridor, there is already a market. Mm -hmm. What the farmers are producing has an assured market and there is a good price for his or her produce. <clears throat> so I'm saying th th these are innovative ways. Is there inno inno innovative, innovative, inno innovative partnerships that, that we, we, we have created in order to address one particular problem that we're facing of trying to transform an, uh, the Tanzanian agriculture that is producing, that is backward, low productivity, predominantly subsistent, less assurance of food security, and therefore widespread poverty. So this, these two initiatives, we can definitely move forward and achieve our objectives. So I can, that's why I started by saying that partnerships are desirable, partnerships are necessary, and they have worked well for Tanzania. I can mention so many other partnerships in so many other fields, but for, 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 for the sake of time, let me mention this particular partnership in agriculture with reference to the Southern Agricultural Development Corridor Circuit and our partnership with AGRA. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And Secretary General Kofi Annan, in, in your role as Secretary General and now in your role as, as a leader on so many different initiatives of which AGRA is, is one example. You've had a chance to experience both what works and doesn't work in partnerships. And what's your sense now about the innovative elements of partnerships here today? Thank you very much, uh, Robert. I think the president has already given us a sense of how useful, how useful um, partnerships could be and this potential to help with transformation in, in certain areas. He's given the example of agriculture where we in, uh, in AGRA, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, are working very closely with governments like his and the farmers on, on the ground. And um, the founding members of the alliance were the Gates and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, and we have been able to get other governments, other institutions to cooperate and to work uh, with us. And I think when you look back where we started a few years ago and the progress that we've made, I'll give you an example in Tanzania. When we were there beginning of April, we went to the field and visited farmers and went to the research station. To our surprise, the leader of the, of the research center was a young PhD graduate who had just trained here in South Africa and returned. And he, was, he replaced an elderly gentleman who had just retired. And they had worked so effectively that in area of maize, they were moving production from two tons per hectare to between eight and nine tons per hectare using conventional uh, breeding. And to see the enthusiasm and the energy and the uh, interest of not just the scientists, but the people around, the farmers, with what they had done was quite uh, uh, remarkable. 
what this partnership has done, not just for Tanzania, but for other countries, is also accelerated change and reform. There were several countries, including Tanzania and my own country, Ghana, where the governments controlled the foundation seed. And therefore, private breeders and others couldn't get into the business. And when we say African farmers are producing uh, per hectare terms, gosh, I think I'm going to have a problem here. Per hectare terms, uh, one third of the global uh, average is because they were using the wrong seeds. They were using seeds which are about 20 years old. When other governments were continuing with research and improving the, the seeds all the time. So working with African scientists and training African scientists, I think we are going to be able to do the same thing. And luckily, the governments have decided to open up. And you've released your foundation seats, uh, and the Ghana and others are doing that, opening up the industry for others to come in, understanding that you can allow others in. What you need to do is to have standards and certification to make sure they meet the standards and they are doing uh, the, the right uh, things. And the president is absolutely right. Our vision is not just to help the smallholder farmers and their families to feed themselves. Yes, we, you start there to help them to feed themselves, but also let them see their farms as a commercial uh, business to produce mm -hmm. for themselves and for the market. And uh, hopefully in time, Africa will become part of the global food security system. It's not a pipe dream. I think it, it can uh, be achieved. The other area where we've tried to make a difference is access uh, of financing to far, uh, farmers. You know, we have a, a system where, for example, in Kenya, putting down a guarantee of $5 million, we leverage it $50 million to $50 million with Equity Bank to use it to provide seeds and fertilizers to farmers. We are working on similar arrangements, and there's even a bigger one that we've worked out with Nigeria, where uh, my good friend here, Strive, who is a member of the board, will explain to you, which will lead to substantial investment uh, into uh, agriculture. And of course, we are also encouraging agribusiness to get involved all along the chain in processing, storage, and marketing so that the farmers can, will be able to sell what they produce. And let me hasten to stress that we, we, we are focused on small-scale farmers, but it doesn't mean that we are opposed to commercial farms. It depends on how it is uh, organized, how it links up with the small-scale farmers because a good and responsible commercial firm amongst the farmers can be a really good asset. They can share technology, they can help provide ready markets, and everybody uh, gains. And of course, where I disagree is those situations where governments come in, lease or buy large tracts of African land to produce for their markets without thinking of the food security needs of the country. In my judgment, any attempt to take large track of lands to provide for foreign markets without considering the local requirements is not a viable model. Because if tomorrow there is a, a drought or shortage, do you really think the people are going to stand by with their arms crossed while you ship the food to your markets? It's not going to happen. So we should start on a very realistic basis to deal with the local food situation. And of course, we are looking at uh, things like uh, the, the, the foreigners are looking at wheat and all this, but there's also a staple food market. The staple food market in Africa is $150 billion. That also needs attention. We need to get involved in that. We need to handle that uh, uh, effectively. What the president has said and what I have said has really indicated that for the first time, perhaps, in many decades, we are seeing a real transformation of African agriculture. And if we sustain the effort, 
we can make it. And the partnership with the private sector, with civil society organizations, with foundations, is really making a difference. Uh, we expect to train many scientists who would really lead the charge. But they also know that they need to work with the farmers and that the farmers uh, have to be their main concern. Whatever they come up with, they have to get it to the farmer, as Borlaug used to say. And I have been quite impressed with this exchange between the scientists and farmers. We did a field trip, I think Strive was with me, in Mali, where talking to so-called illiterate farmers to talk about their agriculture and to discover that these farmers were factoring in climate change into their production and selection of seeds. When we ask a, a young farmer, why would you take this seed and not that one, so the period of maturity is short and I can harvest before the rains cease, because the rains do not, not come as long as it used to. It's not what my father or grandfather told me, so I have to adapt. Why would you select this or the seed? Or oh, the yield is higher, and it's better for me, and also it can resist uh, drought. It grows well in dry areas, or it's been able to resist uh, pests. And, and it was fascinating for us, and so the farmers are ready. It is us to help them move forward with innovative ideas and partnerships and get them going. But you can have this sort of partnerships in many areas. But to have effective partnership, the person in charge of the country, that is a leader and the government, has to take certain basic decisions. Yeah. What should we as a government do? What should we not do? What should we do with others? And what should we leave others to do? In my judgment, governments have no business producing soap and running businesses of that kind. You should leave the private sector to do it. In some of the services, social and health services, there are civil society organizations that are very effective and sometimes can do it better than the government. The government cannot do everything, so that mindset of government doing everything and controlling the situation has to change. But as we heard from the president, they, they, these governments are now open to civil society, uh, to business. I mean, civil society they accepted with some problems, but they more or less accepted them. S business took a while, but now they realize the potential of business and are prepared to work with them. So let's pool our efforts, work in partnership, and transform this continent for the better. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And one of the elements that comes from, from both the speakers is the very bold and comprehensive view of development involved in dealing with issues like agriculture, the small-scale farmers and the agribusiness, government at the local level and at the national level, civil society, all working together in a very comprehensive way with a practical delineation of who can do what best. Very powerful to get the ecosystem right, very challenging. Now, Strad Masiwawa, you've been involved in issues of, of partnership, both in terms of your leadership on AGRA, but also as group executive chairman of Equinet Wireless Group. How do you, from a private sector view, see these kind of issues we were talking about, and what do you see as new or different than five or 10 years ago? Robert, you will allow one, one second advert. advert. Africa Progress Panel issued this report, and I hope you would all try and get a copy. It's the, the, the transformative power of partnerships. Copies are available, and if you don't have it, get to yeah. APP and you will get it. The Africa Progress thank Panel. You, yes, thank you. <laughs> no, no, um, thank you very much. You know, um, I was just remembering that the last time I was here, uh, I was with uh, Dr. Raj Shah a couple of years ago when we came with uh, Secretary General Anand to announce the formation of AGRA. Yeah. And um, you know, I was wearing my Rockefeller hat and uh, Dr. Raj was wearing his Gates hat. 
Now they are Agra. Now we are Agra, <laughs> but he's gone not. to government. <laughs> Uh, but um, I, I just want to use a specific example of the kind of work that we have been doing at AGRA to illustrate what partnership is about, even from the perspective of um, uh, big corporate businesses uh, who may look like we are disengaged mining or telecommunications and so forth. Obviously, we are there to, to try and raise the standard of living of all our people in a sustainable way. Our businesses thrive in prospering communities. And so we took up this challenge uh, when uh, Mr. Anand called for a green revolution for Africa. Now, you know, my daughters were quite confused by this idea of a green revolution uh, because they come from another age and they thought it was an environmental movement. Uh, but uh, green revolution, we're going back to what happened in Asia. Many of us uh, remember the days of uh, uh, extraordinary hunger in India and Bangladesh and the fears that were in the world at the time that we would see uh, starvation on scales that had never been seen before. But it disappeared off the front pages of newspapers. But there were men like uh, Norman Borlaug, working at the Rockefeller Foundation, who understood the science that the yields could be dramatically increased so that we could deal with this issue. And of course, it ended up with a Nobel Peace Prize for him, and uh, it's a great legacy. But the issue of how do we, could we repeat this in Africa? That was the challenge that the Secretary General issued as he left the UN. And uh, Gates, uh, the Gates, uh, Melinda G and uh, Bill Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller were quick to seize on this, to say perhaps now we have the convening power to bring governments, the private sector, civil society, the small-scale farmers themselves, into a partnership to tackle one of the great challenges of our time, which is poverty in Africa and hunger, food security. I just want to use one specific example. Uh, we went to see, the AGRA team went to see the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And, you know, I was privileged enough to participate in those discussions. And I come from an engineering background, so I love numbers. Numbers are, speaks in ways sometimes that words cannot. One percent of all lending in Africa all bank lending goes into agriculture, yet it accounts for 70% of employment. And as the president pointed out, over 50% of GDP in most countries. Clearly, there's a dysfunctional process in the financial value system. And this is what we wanted to tackle in a fresh way. And we sat down with the governor of the Nigerian Central Bank and his team, and we discussed these numbers. And it shows you one of the key elements, you have got to have reformers on the other side who are bold enough to say, look, I've heard you, let's do something. We did the same when we went to see the president of Tanzania. And that's why he's a great partner in all this. And. Um, Governor Sanusi immediately brought all the Nigerian banks together, shared with them the same numbers. And they said it must end, almost with incredible unanimity, people almost weeping. And out of that process, a program emerged, which has just been concluded, to leverage three billion US dollars to help 3.8 million small farmers in Nigeria. I don't need to tell you what that means. Such a massive locomotive giant wakes up and says, I'm going to deal with agriculture. 
And we believe that locomotive is going to pull through Africa. We've seen the same, we did a similar scheme in Ghana with Standard Bank. Extraordinary results. We've just uh, completed um, a review of a program that we did with Equity Bank in Kenya, commercial bank. But we sit down, we talk about the numbers, we talk about the leverage that needs to be released. We talk about fixing not only the financial value system so that it can deliver to agriculture, but so that it can also deliver to the whole economy. You look at Malawi. For as long as anybody could remember, Malawi was a net deficit food producing area. Today, Malawi is a net producer of food, exporting even to her neighbors. Well, and this will be one of the key measures as we actually see at scale the changes in employment levels and production levels and productivity coming out of food. And, and as, as you mentioned, despite the challenges of the previous decade, one's starting to see at scale Malawi being the example, exactly, but we're yes. seeing in other food corridors uh, major changes. And I think one of the questions we're going to come back to is how do we know that we're actually seeing the results? But let me change to an, another area after the key conversation on food, which has essentially been a renewed area of focus. One of the other areas where there's been partnership at best, conflict often in the past, is in the mining sector. And um, Godfrey Gomway is Executive Director of Anglo-America in South Africa. How do you see partnerships, but in particular, could you help focus on what's new or innovative or different, perhaps, than some of the attempts at partnership in the past in the mining industry? And what's the lessons from that? Actually, the, uh, the, the whole question of, um, you know, how do you exploit resources for the benefit of the people, <coughs> especially in emerging markets and the uh, resource-rich countries, is actually quite a critical question which is effectively answered by partnerships between all stakeholders. You know, whether it's governments or it's trade unions or it's communities uh, whom generally we tend to coexist with. And as it turns out that uh, in the many areas where we operate, uh, these are either water-stressed areas or areas where there is no infrastructure. So how do we bring about a value proposition for, for those particular areas so that uh, everyone can benefit out of the activity of mining? And in our own company, uh, and if I can speak specifically to, to, to that as an example, uh, the entire philosophy of partnerships is something that we embrace wholeheartedly, and it actually sits as central as one of the third pillars in our strategy as an organization. And uh, you'll see it is embedded in our value system as well as within our culture. And uh, we believe that partnerships should be based on honesty, they should be based on transparency and trust. And, um, and, but the key, one of the key considerations in deciding on the um, true nature of partnerships is particularly in the resources sector is to understand that mining is a long-term business and the decisions we make generally are for periods of 20 to 30 years and beyond. And therefore, so we're not driven by short-term considerations. And that is the, the, the kind of relationship that we also expect with all our stakeholders, either at the regional level, the local level, or, uh, or at national level, or, or indeed with um, at, at, at multilaterals as well, is to, 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 to come up with a long-term relationship. And, and, and so consequently, you know, as miners, we, we tend to look at ourselves as partners in development uh, with our host governments. And, and, and really, uh, I think to illustrate this, maybe let me give you an example um, of what partnership means in a particular locality, you know, where it enabled uh, proper and appropriate coexistence with uh, local communities. Here in South Africa, in the central region, uh, the Wheatbank coal fields, uh, which is in the east in the province of Pumalanga, uh, Ourselves and BHP uh, Billiton, we're mining coal there, and, but we have a particular problem with water. That several of our mines, which are contiguous to each other, 
you know, are generating nearly, they have almost 140 million megaliters of water, which is, uh, you know, coming from, from, from underground. And, and we're adding 25 megaliters onto that on a sort of a daily basis. And this water, it naturally needs to be treated either before you, you put it, it back out into, into the environment so that it's suitable. But nearby is a town of Whitbank, which is actually water stress. They do not have enough water. So what we came up with was um, a plan to develop a plant which would produce 25 megaliters of water per day, supplying that particular community of 80,000 people with 20% of their water requirements. But to achieve this, we needed obviously the buy-in of four government departments, uh, the, the Mineral Resources Department, the Water Department, uh, the Land Affairs Department, and of course the, the provincial uh, department uh, within, within that particular region. But also what is interesting that this is where two competing commercial organizations actually came together to A, to solve an, a problem which would be an environmental problem because uh, it was impacting on the uh, you know, upper uh, Oliphant River catchment area. And, and, and secondly, you know, to, 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 to effectively put some value into the community through the provision of water. But there was another added benefit to the purification process, and this is uh, that out of the contaminants in, the, in this water is gypsum, which we produce as a byproduct. And actually, we are building for our own employees housing out of this gypsum. You know, so far we've built 66 houses, migrating employees out of the normal mine type housing into normal family units, and we're going to be developing further on this particular project. So I, I think, you know, you know, there is a value proposition in, in, in partnerships in the manner in which uh, they can be, um, in the manner in which they, they, they can be crafted, you know, provided, A, that there is, as I said earlier on, there is trust, and, and secondly, also, you know, it is a value proposition. It's not just simply uh, 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 we do it for the sake of it. It's because, A, number one, you know, we, we see the benefit of, of, of appropriate coexistence with the communities where, where we operate uh, because that actually sits within the ethos of, of, of our organization. So, really, there are many other examples that I'd like to talk about, but I, I think I just want to cut myself short on that and point. I mean, a couple of things have come out very clearly. This, this whole issue of for long-term relations or engagements to work, there has to be a sense of fairness and engagement, including the local community and not just the national community, that there's a, a, a near as well as a far engagement that's extremely important. The other element that comes up again and again in this is this question of trust mm. and clarity of roles and responsibilities, including trust between different private sector actors as you were mm. engaging there. Mm. But obviously, you know, trust with civil society and the community is going to be extremely important. Now, Lindu Imajeli Sabanda is Chief Executive Officer of, of FANPRAN in, in South Africa. How does one address this issue of trust when looking into um, in partnerships. Thank you, Robert. I think what's coming out clear from what the President, His Excellency Kiketo has described is that there's always been a comfort zone when government deals with uh, development partners. The next level becomes uh, private sector. But when you then have to do the leapfrog jump to bring in civil society, suddenly there's a big elephant in the room and everybody says who are they, are they governable, and what is their role. And I think the sooner we appreciate that civil society encompasses the farmers, it encompasses the researchers, it encompasses the private sector, who will break those silos and begin to trust each other. And where I come from when I talk about all these other constituencies of the uh, civil society is that you are really looking at the bottom of the pyramid. You are looking at uh, the people who are running your spaza shops here in, in South Africa, your burial societies, the, the sector that's not currently incorporated into the formal structures. And what you're saying is who is best placed to inform policy development processes to create a conducive policy environment for economic prosperity? 
it is the very people who are affected by the problems, and that's where civil society has a large stake. And I like the slogan that South Africa uses, that nothing for us without us, which means the researchers have a role to generate the evidence, to inform policy processes, but your ordinary citizens have to be equipped with that evidence because they are best placed to inform the policymakers. But we've created this divide which is creating mistrust because we don't know who is holding the information, we don't know who advises our government, and as a result, civil society stands on the side and watches and waits for failure. And then when things go wrong, they say, we told you we've never trusted multinationals, we've never trusted private sector, and yet, through transparent deals, through information sharing, through investment in research, so that we can generate the evidence, own it, and use it to develop evidence-based policies, be it for food security, climate change, any development agenda. And I'd like to share here the experience we've had on climate change. When the climate agenda started, it was really being pushed from the north. And uh, our understanding as civil society was that Africa you grow trees, they will absorb the carbon, and uh, the north can go ahead polluting. So in most cases, what happened when you had the international meetings, the global negotiations through the UN, you will have select NGOs, your civil societies that are funded from the north, that will go away and raise placards at these global meetings to say, we don't want any deal um, that, 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 that is not in favor of Africa. We studied what it is that is for the benefit of Africa. And we realize that 25 of the most vulnerable countries when it comes to climate change, 50% of those are in Africa. And what that means is that we've got a great stake to craft our own messages, generate the evidence, and take it to mm -hmm. inform the global policy agenda. We've launched the No Agriculture, No Deal agenda at. Uh, um, uh, COP14, which was in Poznan. In Copenhagen, we were able to convene an agriculture day, and we are hoping with Deben we can mobilize all civil society Africa-wide with, as Mr. Anand said, research generated by our global partnerships to inform the post-Kyoto protocol so that there is no deal that does not embrace agriculture, which is the backbone of our economies in Africa. I think the point of not just engaging civil society, but having civil society in the discussion empowered with real facts and analysis yeah. actually can create the platform for understanding where the win-win elements might be. Now, Mark, one of the things that's very interesting is that typically when one talks about development, one complains about there being too many people involved, too many actors, the complexity of donors and so on. And yet, you might have noted as, as the director of policy and advocacy of, of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Almost everybody mentioned the Gates Foundation, but nobody seemed to say, geez, this new actor was just one more confusion. In every case, it was seen in a positive way. So tell me, what is it the Gates Foundation's view is on partnership? And, and what is it that you see as your value added when you come into these already complex conversations? And what's the secret sauce that seems to make it that, that people are seeing you as such a, a useful additional partner in this? Yes, well, we, we hope that continues. but. Uh, I think the main point uh, from us as a foundation is that we actually have no choice but to operate through, uh, through partnerships. We don't act directly as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We select and seek out a wide range of partners, and in fact, it's, it's been incredibly encouraging to sit here on the podium and hear the talk about the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa, and remembering that it is only four years that we sat on this very podium and launched uh, the idea and, and uh, announced uh, our new chairperson, and that was a very new partnership, an unproven partnership, and we can hear from the comments of President Kikweti of everybody that this is now an established partnership that brings together a wide range of different actors uh, from the Nigerian Central Bank, from private sector actors like Equity and Standard Bank, from civil society in a very successful way. And from the Gates Foundation's perspective, we see our role is trying to find and help catalyze successful models of partnership like that against issues that we really care about. 
And uh, to stick, while this is true in areas we work around from health to financial services, sticking with the agriculture theme, let me give you just two other very concrete examples where we see our role can really be as a little bit of a catalytic convener that helps bring together the different players. And uh, one example is uh, working with coffee farmers in, in East Africa and several countries in East Africa where uh, the difficulty is how do you help access uh, markets for smallholder producers who uh, might have a comparative advantage but can't naturally produce at the scale or with the right quality uh, to market to international purchases. And there we've worked with a partner, TechnoServe, uh, which helps put in place the intermediaries, the cooperatives that allow the farmers to actually uh, collect at scale, the washing stations, which are the tools that allow them to do the quality sorting to market, and then the connection to markets ha then happen fairly naturally, and that's a program which over time, it's several years old now, will ultimately, we hope, uh, double the income of around 180,000 smallholder farmers. Uh, a second example is actually working with an international public sector actor, the World Food Program, uh, which is uh, called the Purchase for Progress uh, program, which is, uses the World food, food Program's purchasing power as the largest net buyer of food in Africa to again source those foods from smallholder producers who traditionally have not been able to produce at the scale and at the quality required. And with uh, support from us, support from other foundations like the Howard Buffett Foundation and, and now other donors, Increasing that is a program that now, in a few short years, operates in 20 different countries, has already benefited over 100,000 farm families, in some cases has very quickly, in the space of as little as a year, quadrupled the income uh, of individual farmers. And it's our role, again, is how do you help bring these players together? They're the private sector partners, they're public sector partners. Uh, there's a general willingness, and what are the three keys to success? And I think this applies to the very good example in mining we've, we've also heard. You need role clarity, you need clear mutual benefit, and you need the ability to be flexible and actually course correct, because very few partnerships work seamlessly from the start. There are always some things that need to help and be adjusted, but as long as you have those other three actors combined with what uh, you'd already talked about, which is a mutual respect and trust, I think you have a very solid foundation to build off, and that's something I hope we as the foundation really help provide uh, with partners on the stage and around the room and elsewhere. Well, and it's interesting, the other element too is the kind of the new mindsets in terms of applying business models to achieve complementary goals. So the food aid program that the World Food Program is in, in charge of being used to not only deal with food aid, but actually help encourage food production in the regions that need it most is a way to get a, a double leverage. So lots of exciting ideas in terms of the more comprehensive, joined up approach to partnership, a bold and ambitious uh, approach to many of these issues with kind of country leadership on many of it, but then with the appropriate allocation of different roles in a very practical way, Gates Foundation or others providing a catalytic role, but then with a real focus on results and alignment and coming back in many cases that there's a market behind all of this. So these are the good elements. Before I turn it over to Raj, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge or frustration when looking at partnerships? Well, I, I think the frustration is less with the partnerships themselves when they work, but with the easy way in which the concept is thrown around. Partnership is something that everybody wants to think, well, we can announce, whether it's a public-private partner, whether it's a partnership with civil society, it really is not about two actors getting together and saying, hey, this looks good, we think uh, this will project well if, if we say we're doing this together. It really, the difficulty is doing that upfront mapping of really are there mutual benefits, is there real role clarity, are there different things that the partners actually bring that make the action or the joint activity greater than the sum of the parts. I mean, it, it sounds yeah. trite, but actually that's a lot more difficult to do in practice than it sounds, and I think that's the biggest problem, is, is things that look like they might be partnerships. Lots of people saying, hey, we'd like to partner with you, but really trying to dig and see, is this something that is really going to add value at the end of the day and hopefully become self-sustaining at the end of the day? Well, and I can attest that when the Canadian government was working with Gates on an issue, Gates was very good at saying, is the money additional? Is there real value added? Is this true? Is it just a, a, a re-announcement of an existing approach or is it real value added? So maybe what we should have is a Gates-certified real partnership uh, yes. a, approach here. Raj Shah, you've got a, a double advantage here because as the very energetic, uh, and, and bold administrator of USAID. You've been thinking a lot about this, and of course, as the last member listening to this, you've, you've been able to hear all the different views. What's your key, key views on partnership that you'd like to add to this conversation so far? 
Well, you know, I would only add one concept, and that is that fundamentally the biggest and the best and the most productive partnerships, and we've heard a lot of wonderful examples, uh, some of which I'm proud to associate with, are uh, require most partners that join the partnership to do things differently. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we're being very honest, that's hard. It, it was frankly less hard at a when I was at the Gates Foundation because uh, we didn't have a lot of history and we had a lot of flexibility. Uh, now I'm at USAID, which is a tremendous organization with 9,000 staff around the world. We're in 97 countries. We program out $24 billion against some incredibly aspirational goals. Uh, but we have a long history of how we evolved to get there. And so joining these bigger, more transformational partnerships pushes us to change the way we work so we can be great partners. And I, I would just give you a few examples. Uh, in Tanzania, as President Kikwete described the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor, that's going to be the focus of our program in Tanzania. Uh, and as we were scaling up our agriculture program there, instead of uh, going to our usual partners, we, we started by joining the President's leadership and saying, there was a committee that had come together. It included, as the president described, all aspects of civil society, private sector, AGRA, and others. And by being part of that collaborative process, it took 18 months to put uh, an investment plan together that is now almost complete and will allow us to make very sizable commitments that we all believe will transform that agricultural corridor into a driver of growth for Tanzania and for the region. Uh, but the U.S. Congress gets impatient when you say you're spending 18 months consulting and planning and listening to civil society and talking to smallholder farmers. But we have to be strong and stick with that process because as difficult as it is to do, it is the right thing to do and it gets us better results. We've also tried to introduce innovation in a more fundamental way throughout our programs, both in terms of how we work and in what we choose to work on. In another uh, great partnership, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. The whole world has come together to expand access to immunizations for children all around the world. Uh, but now we have two new vaccines, rotavirus and pneumococcus, uh, pneumonia and diarrhea, essentially, that would save, we estimate, five or 600,000 lives additionally per year if we could expand access to those vaccines. So we've pulled our missions together around the world, and we've said, please consult with the ministries of health, identify where ministries need refrigerators and cold chain support, where they need uh, longer-term financing partnerships, and let's engage in a, in a deeper conversation about how we dramatically accelerate the introduction of those two new vaccines, because we know that, in general, in global public health, there can be a 12, 15, 20-year lag between the development of these new technologies and their actual propagation out to the people who need them the most, whose lives get saved. Of course, that requires us to unwind some of our programs and create financial space uh, and partnership space to get that project done. Uh, and it will take another 18 months of con deep consultation with 30 or 40 countries that are aggressively looking to scale up access. But I think that will be worth it because of the hundreds of thousands of lives saved that's at the other end of that uh, relatively tough but important process. And finally, I, I would just say that we've really tried to think hard about uh, how instead of doing more of the same or instead of uh, reverting back to the bureaucratic processes that can sometimes be the easiest or most familiar things and where you frankly are, are the most protected, doing a contract extension or uh, continuing to be part of a project that may or may not have data that demonstrates it works. We're trying to be very results-oriented in how we allocate resources. And so we've implemented, for instance, a rule that we're, not, uh, we're no longer doing no-bid extensions for all contracts around the world. And as a result, uh, I have perhaps been less popular than I would have been had we not had that rule. Uh, but a lot of wonderful leaders at USAID around the world are asking the tough questions and saying, OK, we, we're not just going to extend this. Did this work? Uh, should we do it differently? How can we learn from those guys down the street that have got mobile phones out to 97% of the population and explore whether we can partner with them in a more innovative way to get better results faster? 
And just for me to travel around the world and see the amount of creativity that is unlocked by changing some of the rules and processes of the organization has been eye-opening and inspiring. And I think the future of development for all of us is to follow the leadership of leaders like President Kikwete, uh, take the opportunities to innovate when we see a rotavirus or a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine sitting there ready to save lives, and push ourselves to really think about if we were achieving progress in a relatively slow rate of success, are there things we can do to cease what we're doing, sit down with new thinkers and new partners, often private sector leaders, and say, how can we dramatically bend the curve of progress and accelerate our path towards outcomes? But it's hard, and, and sometimes I fear we make it sound too easy. It's challenging for people, it puts people at risk. And uh, the wonderful thing about this panel and the leadership here is that they're all tremendous leaders that have encouraged us and me over time to take those risks. Uh, but, but it offers a lot of space and encouragement when, when the President Kikwete or Kofi Annan says, no, let's think about this for a while and let's get this right. And that's the right instinct. So, uh, so we're trying at USAID. I think I'm very excited about the transformation I see, not just at aid, but at DFID, at uh, other uh, international, large international bilateral agencies. And I think President Zelik just gave a wonderful speech about transforming the World Bank in the same regard. And we could end up in a few years with 120, 140 billion dollar a year official aid agencies uh, that are basically focused on partnership, innovation, and results in a much more fundamental way if we keep on this path of change. Great, and in fact, the pneumococcal vaccine is doubly exciting because in fact a lot of vaccine was developed through innovative partnerships itself with an advanced market commitment where aid agencies put money on the table to say to drug companies, you do the work, you take the risk, you do the research, but if you come up with a commercially viable vaccine, we'll pre-commit to buy so many amounts. So in fact the creation of the pneumococcal vaccine that you're now helping to propagate the distribution of is another great example of, of innovative approaches. President Kikwete, let me come back to the question of these partnerships because it's an inspiring example, but it's challenging. And in fact, in your country, in your continent, in your own party, there's been historically quite a suspicion of engaging that the private sector. And tell me, how does one deal with the challenge of trust and engagement? And what realistically is it that you would look for to say, well, in this case, we can actually trust that the players are involved in the right way? But also, what do you see as examples that you are still concerned about where you don't think people from the private sector are engaging in the right way? Well, uh, policies change. Countries remain the same. Uh, but, you know, at, at, at some point, we, we try the socialist experience, e experiment. Of course, most African countries try that experiment because at independence, uh, we had certain views about being colonized and why we are in, in, in a certain situation or have underdevelopment. And most countries thought probably the, the socialist option was the best option. This is the time when we, 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 we had problems with, with the private sector. Uh, but beginning 1986, we, we, we embarked on economic reforms. Mm -hmm. And the principal rule in, 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 in these reforms has been let governments govern and private sector do business. So this, this, this is now the, the, the new guide, guide, guiding principle. That for us in government, our, 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 our main preoccupation should be law and order, creating conducive conditions for the private sector to thrive, provide basic social and economic services. But otherwise, when it comes to doing business, 
this is now left in the hands of the private sector. So to us now, the, the, there is no suspicion working, working with the private sector because the, the, the policy paradigms have changed. There has this, been this major policy shift, and therefore we consider the private sector as partners. Yeah. And instead of being adversaries, as they used to be when we, 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 we were pursuing a socialist path. So, 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 in fact, the different models of organization, sure. just as, as Raj was saying, within aid agencies, there's been a, a dramatic change, and in fact, in a sense, that's what creates the space for many of the different innovations we're just talking about now. We're going to throw it open to the floor, but for those who've been listening, any other particular comments that anyone would like to make on what they've heard before so far? Please. Let's try. Oh, I saw. Thank you. Um, well, you know why we love Tanzania, don't you? Um, you know, when I first went to uh, met President Kikwete, uh, the most, it was profound for me was, he said to me, what ideas do you think I can do to improve situations for you people to invest in this country? Uh, it was the sincerity that came from that dialogue. Uh, which has drawn many, many people to, to Tanzania. But I just wanted to point out one area. We've talked, we've almost made partnership in the context, in this debate, almost as a government to private sector. Because we as private sector, we live in partnership. There's nothing we do in any country uh, where we, we might call it different things, joint venture, whatever, but you know, in today's business, anyone seriously trying to build a global business knows that you cannot do anything without a, in a, without a sincere approach to partnership. I just wanted to give you one anecdotal example of a partnership we're currently engaged in, uh, talking about vaccines. Uh, somebody brought us a study recently to talk about vaccines, storage of vaccines in rural areas. And we realized from that discussion that as cell phone operators, we build towers around the country, particularly in the rural areas. And in most instances, we are the only people with a critical, what we call a, 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 a critical power supply. Mm -hmm. And we realize that our base stations, whether the power supply works or not, we will make sure those base stations work. So we've now begun to put refrigerators, refrigerated containers, around the countries where we operate, with partners uh, working with, a, with donor organizations to store vaccines so that they are using the power supply from That's our great. systems. Uh, the, because we have partnered for it. In, it's for some of you, it may even look flimsy, but you know, we fought a few years ago, we had a major outbreak of cholera in one of the countries where we operate. And U UNICEF came to us and said, look, we've got to stop the spread of this thing. And we, you know, we print these little recharge cards and with a basic message at the back about people washing their hands. It looks simple, but had a dramatic impact in terms of education. So, uh, the, the, and it's, it's great when we begin to reimagine our relationship with the private sector. We are, we are not adversaries. We are really one and the same people, trying to achieve the same goals. Thank you very much. It's a great, and, and what's really interesting about that and exciting about that is it's innovations within those partnerships. So it's not trying to recreate systems and infrastructure that are in the West, but actually, Raj, a point you made in another context yesterday, it's actually trying to create the right appropriate technologies and approaches to actually solve the problems here through yeah. these new combinations of technologies and business models. Please. Raj touched on the issue of uh, spending a lot of time on planning and doing things different. And for a long time, we were puzzled when that became the main agenda because we thought we had to come up with new ways of doing business. But the bottom line is that it's about doing more or less the same, but in a more sustainable manner, both in economic terms, social and environmental sustainability. And once you break it down to the cultural context, 
you find that innovation comes out of that, and that's what's been exciting. And I think on the issue of planning, what's been exciting is the Feed the Future initiative that the U.S. government has come up with, where they've spent time to develop the M&E framework with full engagement of civil society. That way, we will know what we've achieved. We've spent time to benchmark, and that way you can articulate and measure the impact from the people's perspective. A great way of building partnerships. You actually yeah. have a shared view of what you're trying to achieve up yeah. front. Please, sir. Um, <coughs> thanks, Robert. I just have uh, two, uh, two points I'd like to make. And the, the one is that uh, uh, we've discovered, we realized that uh, actually you can create jobs through your normal mining activity. So we build a mine and we staff the mine with, with people. So those are the mainline jobs. But actually, invariably, the, the problem was what actually happens to the communities around? Yeah. You know, how do they uh, generate a livelihood? Yeah. So we have a, a model that we call the anglo Zimele model, which means to stand on one's feet. And uh, we have taken it upon ourselves to, to assist local communities, you know, with business plans, help them finance, mentor them, and uh, you know, you know, with the with their respective businesses, and either support them through our own supply chain, or even the local community type of projects like uh, hair saloons and things like that, you know, completely outside of our main line activity. And this business model has been so successful that since 1990, sorry, since 2008, uh, we have generated an additional 14,400 jobs here in South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, out of over 840 uh, businesses. And this is not big money that we're investing into this. The cost per job here is uh, almost somewhere around in the region of 3,000 rand per job. And if you compare that with, uh, with the cost per job of establishing, let's say, a platinum mine, you're talking into the millions uh, per job. So we're now rolling out this in all the other countries where we operate, the other 45 or countries where we operate, you know, Chile, Brazil, you know, Australia, so that this can be a model for, for actually putting economic activity into the communities where, where we operate. So that's one, that's an example that I just thought I would just share with you because it's actually quite, quite important uh, in the context of creating jobs uh, uh, within the nations where we all operate. And, and the second point I just wanted to, to share also just briefly is that uh, actually the, the point about innovation has come out quite a lot and that's really critical because, um, you know, there is no one size fits all. You know, we've discovered that, uh, you know, you know, best practice is important. Yes, we can learn from that. But actually, you cannot impose a solution out of the one community, let's say, here in, in the north, in the Limpopo, and take that solution and impose it in, in Brazil, for instance, because it will not work, even if it might be best practice here. So, so we have internally developed, actually, our own internal social economic assessment toolkit to establish what is it exactly that the community wants on a bottom-up basis so that we can then work together to prescribe solutions that work for those communities uh, in the most appropriate manner. Thank Thanks, you. Robert. Mr. Anand? Yeah, well, there's one issue I want to raise briefly, and it's a question of social trust for these uh, partnerships and relations to, to work and be sustainable. There has to be social trust. Otherwise, uh, some groups will not get into the partnership, or if they get into it, it will not last. I mean, I've had situations where presidents and prime ministers have asked me, we talked about civil society. Who are these so-called civil society groups? Whom are they working for? Who gives them money? What is their agenda? Which politicians are they supporting? And it takes a long time to get them to understand civil society can be neutral, working in the interest of the country and the community without supporting any political groups. Or they dismiss them as all these civil, uh, civil society groups are failed politicians, you know, uh, or are using it to get into politics, which is uh, not, not uh, correct. Business, they suspected, will exploit They've always exploited us. They will do that. And as a 
uh, we've, said, we've heard here, that has changed. And there's acceptance and openness, but we have to work on that, that question of trust and, and to encourage more partnerships. Otherwise, people are not going to get into it. If they think they're going to put in lots of effort and the government or somebody can wake up tomorrow and put an end to it. And so I wanted to stress this question of trust and the social trust and the, in the development of relationships. Thanks. Yeah, Raj, did you want to comment on that? I, I just want to add to that because uh, in, in my experience, you know, building that trust takes time. And often, and it takes time of working together. It, it often requires the ability for organizations to overcome some setbacks. And as I was thinking about me, many of the great references to Agra here, I was recalling the amount of work that uh, the team has done you know, to overcome some of the early setbacks. And now at a bilateral aid agency, I'm trying to create the capacity for our agency to uh, be rigorous in our evaluation and our accountability for how money moves and what we achieve, but also to create some flexibility so that we, we have some space to learn and adapt and change as part of joining these partnerships. And to be honest, I think it's hard. I think one thing that would be very helpful is for the people in this room uh, on the stage that have a tremendous credibility to be talking about development in a way that is about partnership and where we need to have the flexibility to be able to withstand some small failures so that we can have the really big successes. And, and I find, as I start talking that way on, on Capitol Hill, for example, a lot of people said, oh, you can, you can say those things at the Gates Foundation, but you can't say that in Congress. Uh, and that has been the mindset for a long time. But actually, when I sit down with members of the Senate or members of the House, I think they, they get it, and they, and they respect the fact that we're being honest about the fact that not everything's going to work, but we're going to share the things we learn and try to do things better, and we're not going to give up right away. Uh, but if that were more of the culture of the official development community, I think we'd be better partners in these types of partnerships. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a really good point, because in fact, the, the point made about how the DNA of business now is, is very much, you know, partnership is part of it, but partnership involves vulnerability because it means it's actually passing over to someone else part of what you're trying to deliver. And so being able to actually build that trust and then communicate the mutual success is probably absolutely essential for these partnerships to work. And then to deal with the inevitable setbacks that one may have at, at, at certain points. Mark, maybe you can talk about how do you deal with this challenge of experimentation, partnerships, and inevitable failure at times? Because if you have a portfolio of 100 projects and you're really pushing the envelope, some of them have to fail. I mean, otherwise you're maybe not pushing enough. In the private sector, you can actually have that built in. In the development areas, Raj mentioned, it's more difficult. I mean, how do, how do you ch deal with that challenge? No, I, I think it's a real challenge, uh, both historically, um, and in the current thing is that there is increasingly uh, a comfort level, I'd say, with the rhetoric of risk taking and failure, uh, but a real difficulty when it comes up actually against discussing real failures. And I think that there are serious constraints, particularly in, in uh, with like President Kikweti and, and Raj at USAID, when you are accountable to taxpayers about resources uh, they are much higher and, and reasonable expectations that those resources are going to be used effectively and in an accountable manner and with real results at the end. And so actually I think part of the role, again, that, that foundations and others, uh, others like us can play is take some of those higher risk leverage bets because we are more comfortable uh, with failure in practice. Uh, we want to make sure we're on the right side of the dividing line between risk and recklessness. But I think being able to take that experimentation, to take the longer term view, to really be able to come up with some of the models and say, okay, here, we've done this, we found this bit way work better than, than others and really don't try this approach at all because that was a complete failure and we found out because civil society helped tell us so or whatever the, it might be. But allowing a, a sort of almost a, a chain or an ecosystem of, of partners who are able to take slightly riskier investments and so on and then to come back 
uh, with particularly when you do come back to, to government and public sector approaches that have to be sort of mainstream and leveraged, that there there needs to be a slightly more reasonable burden of proof that we're fairly confident there's going to be success around that. But I think that balance uh, is important and exactly the kind of, um, you know, accustoming uh, both the public and uh, key players, whether it's in Congress or elsewhere, to an open discussion about failure is, is really healthy and I think important that we all try and contribute um, to enabling that discussion by being as open as we can about the failures when we come across them. It's a really interesting concept so that complementary roles may also be complementary risk profiles. Who can actually be involved and who could be the public policy prospectors on this, to use a mighty analogy, and who can be the actual developers once something's been done. Raj, I know in, in the spirit of partnership, you're being called away because of a, of a plain commitment. Any last points that you would like to make on, on the partnership element? Well, thank you very much for, for your engagement. I think USAID is a great example of the changing approach to development. So. Thank you for being here. Now, we, we literally have nine and a half minutes left, So, but what I'd like to do is, is take the risk in the spirit of partnership to actually open it up to in any, a couple of questions and comments. So I'm counting on you, in terms of making myself vulnerable as the moderator, that your interventions will be short and specific in terms of either some comments or questions. And if, if we have a microphone, we have a microphone, so do I have a hand to attach to that microphone? Where's that? Ah, uh, please, over here, sir. Adam Mutabara from Zimbabwe. Uh, there's a new drive towards what is being called creating shared value where there's a need to align business success to community success, business success and environmental success. In the partnerships we have discussed, to what extent are we pushing this new idea of creating shared value between business and government, between business and the community, between business and the environmental agenda, where we are arguing that you actually can't be successful as a business unless the community succeeds. You can't actually be successful as a business unless the climate change agenda is addressed. What are the views on this notion from Michael Porter of creating shared value? Thank you very much, Arthur. Great point. Please, ma'am, at the front. Thank you, Aroma Ote, Nigeria. I just wanted to um, hear other examples of effective partnerships. I'm very excited um, about Agra, uh, and we're looking forward to transforming agriculture in Nigeria. Uh, but I don't know if there are other examples of, of, of this that you can share with us. Thank you. Great. Maybe what we could do is I could turn to the panel for who would like to answer the, the point of how do you integrate the issue of, of climate change within in, in some of these areas and also what are the other uh, concrete examples of, of success along the agri level that maybe can, can inform the audience on this? Please, who would like to? I can take the climate Sure. Please, on the climate change. I think on climate change, what's been happening is that um, one of the challenges we face is the parallel planning processes. We have currently 25 countries that have developed their CADA compact, and 17 of those have gone on to develop their investment plans. Parallel to that, you've got 30 countries that have developed their national adaptation plans for climate change, and some are developing their mitigation plans. And the bottom line is where is the financing for all those going to come from? Is it new money or is it the same developmental money? And I think what we need to do is uh, maybe take a leaf of, from what uh, Tanzania has done, where you focus. You've defined a specific location where you are going to, to, to develop the corridor. Mm -hmm. Can you climate proof that investment? Because the bottom line is the common purpose is prosperity, economic growth, social, and environmental sustainability. But I think we still are struggling with these parallel processes, and that way the money then becomes too thin to spread across the different plans that we are developing. So we need the leadership that can look at the bigger picture and integrate these uh, processes, which are a good thing because we are beginning to plan. We're beginning to involve a lot of players in developing the plans, and we're also bringing in indicators for success that will advise us when we have delivered on what we want to do. 
But I think the bottom line now is if we are going to make any development, let's climate proof that development and talk the same language with the common goal. Mark, maybe I can add, turn the question of other examples to you. I mean, you, you see a lot of them. In addition to what's being discussed today, are there one or two examples of partnership that just really get you excited about what it represents? Well, I think it's, as opposed to doing specific partnerships, I think, let me answer the question with kind of types of partnerships. And I think it is that nature that, again, coming back for the World Economic Forum, the notion of a public-private partnership uh, is not a new one. It's a phrase that's been thrown around these halls for a very long time. And while I think genuine private-private partnerships uh, of the kind that uh, Strive and Godfrey are much more common and accountable and, and tend to happen against a much clearer set of accountability results, normally the bottom line of profit. It's either generating profit or not, and uh, you have very clear metrics. What we're trying to find is, is, is sort of build in what are the uh, types of partnerships that do genuinely allow often several private sector actors to come in that with the public sector actors, with farmers groups or other groups, if we use the agriculture examples. And they're complex. Um, and I think the key bit is they, they do need that kind of upfront time that Raj was talking about. But in our experience, and again, we're relatively new to the game. Our agriculture program, for example, is still only four and a half years old, uh, a little older than Agra itself. But we find that really putting in that upfront time and, and trying to map out very clearly who is going to bring what to the table, what does it actually look like, you know, do we need the full range of power? Can you actually get the same results with fewer people rather than more people? Because it's always easier to coordinate fewer, but sometimes you do need a wider set of actors. So it's, it's less a sort of specific answer of, hey, this partnership is what you should replicate, but it's more the process of how you go about mapping out the partnership in advance and who's going to put what resources in, human or financial, uh, what is the policy-enabling environment you might need. And the more you can get that done and, and agreed up front with real clarity over what the benchmarks of success are, or failure are going to be, the more likely those partnerships are going to succeed. And again, that may sound uh, sort of relatively obvious, but our experience is in practice that's actually pretty difficult to do to sit down and have people be really brutally honest about that up front because there's a predisposition to want partnerships to succeed. And I think just, uh, uh, again, mm -hmm. a, a discipline that comes more naturally in the private sector because you've got investors just kicking the tides and kicking the tides, say, really, do we think this risk is worth taking, uh, that is often more difficult in, in some of the more development-oriented uh, partnerships investments we're talking about. Excellent. We're, we're coming towards the end. I just want to check with the panel any key elements that we've missed or, or last message that I'd like to leave with, with the audience. Thank you. Um, you know, the first time I, I visited the United States, I was looking for a partner. And I arrived there, I was much younger than I am today. I'm still young, uh, but the gentleman I visited, we spent um, three days, and each time I said to him, I want to talk about what I came for, he said, let me show you my city. Then he took me to see his home. Then he took me to see the zoo. And on the third day, um, I said to him, you know, when are we gonna do some business? He said to me, young man, if you want to go into a partnership, you must first know your partner. If, you know, whatever you want to do in partnership, the fundamental to it is you've got to know your partner. Uh, you know, there are different types of partnership. We can do a partnership for a project, which is going to last three months. Well, you know, we don't really have to get on, because at the end of three months, you go your way, I go my way. But when we start a business together, uh, it's like a marriage, and we have a baby. <laughs> uh, we've got to know each other. You know, my message particularly to my African colleagues is if, certainly those from business, if you want to build partnerships, start building <coughs> partnerships amongst yourselves as Africans. The truth is, many Africans believe they are imbued with the knowledge 
of their neighboring country. Nigerian, if you say to him, do you know Tanzania? He says, yes, I know Tanzania, of course. But the reality is he's never been there. What we need to do is we've got to know our partners and we've got to know the terrain. Uh, we've got to travel within this continent. You know, I've got to urge you, so many of you Africans, you don't know Africa. Some of these white people know Africa better than you. You've just get to get out there. Visit Nigeria, visit Niger. Don't live with these myths. Nigerians are like this, Zimbabweans are like this. Go there. You are going to be, that's where you are going to prosper. When you get to know Africa, get to know the terrain, and that's my message. Thank well, and, you. and thank you. Thanks to this great panel. We know a lot more about partnership than we did an hour and a quarter ago. And I think, I now think the, the idea of the fair process is so important. So maybe PPP is now the persistent process of partnership. Thank you very much. And please welcome me in thanking this panel.